Thank you so much, <coughs> and welcome to the chat room of cancer. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. My journey started more than ten, or almost 10 years ago when I moved to Boston to work for a great mentor at Harvard University. My, um, my topic was to work on gene therapy approaches for treatment of brain cancer. And it was during this journey that I stumbled onto a discovery that actually changed my research focus, my career path, and also my life. I'll get back to that in a little bit. First, I will give you a little bit of an introduction. Every cell in our body contains the, the human genome, our DNA. And DNA is important because DNA tells the cell what to do. It also tells the cell how to build a human. We all start as a single cell. But the human adult contains more than a thousand billions of these cells. And when the cell needs to divide and multiply, it needs to perfectly copy the DNA inside that cell. Sometimes that copy is not perfect and something goes wrong. It makes a mistake, also known as a mutation. Cancer is a cell that has lost control due to these mutations in the DNA. The cancer starts to grow uncontrollably, and it also gets a characteristic that makes it very difficult to treat, and that is its ability to change. Cancer is an expert of changing over time. When we study cancer, we often take a biopsy or a piece of the tissue, piece of the tumor, and we study it. And we can look at the genetic content, we can study the mutations that have happened within the tumor. And this has led to a lot of progress in the way we treat cancer today. However, there is a flaw with taking a small piece of the tumor. It may not represent the entire disease. It's just a small piece. It's also um, just a snapshot in time. You're only seeing what the tumor looks like at the time of surgery, which we all know now is incomplete because tumors change over time. So optimally, we would have a way to monitor this uh, as the patient goes on to treatment. Every patient has a unique DNA. We're all unique, and so is our cancer. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a, a very easy, non-invasive way, like taking a urine sample or a blood sample and be able to monitor the change of the tumor over time? This is where this story begins. The story begins a late night in a laboratory. I had just come back from surgery with my uh, uh, colleague and friend, Bob, the neurosurgeon. He had removed a piece of a brain cancer, and I brought it with me back home to the lab. And I was looking at this cell, and this is when it all happened. Contrary to popular belief, scientific discoveries rarely starts with, Eureka, I found it. It's more often, hmm, that looks funny. I wanted to look at the cell, and uh, what caught my attention was not the actual cell, but the background. It looks like the cell was blebbing. There were vesicles coming off of this cell. And I thought to myself, hmm, that looks funny. So the next time I uh, came back from uh, uh, surgery with Bob, I took another cell sample, and I applied a more powerful microscope, uh, called an electron microscope, to look at the more details of, of this blebbing event. And this is when I found something else. There was an even higher abundance of smaller vesicles that I hadn't seen in the light microscope pr previously. So this was a little bit confusing to me. Every time I zoomed in and looked more carefully at the sample, there was a new universe of peculiarities that emerged. 
When I further isolated what came off of these cells, I saw that these were tiny vesicles, very similar in size as a virus particle. If you place them next to each other, it would take a thousand of these to bridge the diameter of a hair. And this was, this was uh, very interesting to me in particular because of my virology background. So I wanted to know what these things were that looked like viruses but were clearly not virus. These vesicles, it turned out, were also known as exosomes. Exosomes were news to me at that time. However, they were not news to everyone. Exosomes had been studied for a very long time in the research literature. And, however, the, the exosomes weren't considered very useful for medicine. The reason for that was that they were claimed to contain protein and lipids, but no RNA. RNA is very important, because RNA is the language of the cell. And it's also a reflection of the DNA. So if you have changes in your DNA, you can see that reflected on the RNA. So I had decided that that day I would challenge the norm. I would try to see if I could find RNA inside these vesicles, contrary to the, the previous belief. And that was the day that changed my life, because I had found that these exosomes were full of RNA from the cancer. So we could use this exosome compartment as a proxy for the tumor. So in the case for brain cancer, we could actually study the brain cancer RNA mutations without drilling a, a hole in someone's head and taking out a piece of the tumor. Um, this started uh, a whirlwind effect. Um, I founded a company based on this, identified some visionary investors that were believing in the idea and saw the relevance of this discovery. And since that day, I have dedicated my life to study uh, these exosomes and reveal the secrets of the exosomal RNA. RNA is the language of the cell. And it's exactly the type of information that we need to make the patient's treatment better. Because when we look at the RNA, we can see what mutations the tumor have, and that will indicate what type of treatment will work in that patient. So you can personalize your treatment to a certain uh, individual cancer. So when you have the RNA inside these exosomes, um, an interesting easy analogy to that is a Twitter message. So the RNA is inside these vesicles, but instead of the characters in Twitter, we're talking about RNA sequences. And instead of typos or errors in your Twitter, we're talking about mutations from the cancer. However, these cells are making even the most ambitious teenager jealous, because a single cell can release more than 10,000 of these Twitter messages per day. It also turns out that cancer cells can use these Twitter messages to its own advantage. It uses it for cellular communication. So it can send out exosomes to uh, stimulate cancer growth, or even suppress the immune response, the body's natural defense to cancer. <clears throat> so, how do we listen in to the chatter of the cancer cells? How do we study the RNA inside these exosomes? A few years ago, it was a very tedious process. It took expensive uh, instrumentation and skill to look at this RNA. If we want this to become a diagnostic that we can use for any patient, this would not work. We had to develop something that was faster, cheaper, and more efficient. Today, we can use something that is more efficient. This 
is an example of one of the many exosome isolation platforms that have been developed today. It looks very simple. However, it's the first and most critical step in intercepting these RNA messages in the biofluids to listen in to the cancer cell. Interestingly, when you are trying to listen in to these cancer cells, if you, if you have ever tried to overhear a conversation, it's very difficult to hear the conversation if there's a lot of chatter in the background. And the same is true for cancer. So when you, when you try to listen in on the cancer, you have a thousand billion cells in the body, and they all chat. And you're trying to decipher this message in the background of all that noise. And up until recently, we have been bound to only study this cancer genetics at a single point in time. However, with this uh, new platform, we can interrogate what happens inside the tumor at any given time point with a very easy available biofluid such as blood or a urine sample. And with this, we can also learn about the ever-changing landscape of cancer, because ch cancer is very dynamic, and a single tissue sample in time is not going to be sufficient for you to, to give the most optimal treatment at the most appropriate time. Having this platform, or this uh, Twitter message, um, it's almost like a liquid biopsy platform where you can take this sample in a much less invasive way. Everyone can agree that you'd rather pee in a cup multiple times rather than having a tissue sample removed from you every week. It can also give us a completely new understanding on how cancer are responding to treatments and how cancer is evolving to avoid our treatment. I mentioned that it's challenging to, to, to hear this chatter in the background of someone speaking, uh, speaking at the same time as this cancer. Luckily, the exosomes have the solution for that. Exosomes has a feature that it comes with markers on its surface, almost like a FedEx shipment label, where it tells you where the exosome come from. We can actually use this as a tool to fish out the real messages that we are interested in and to study those specific cancer messages. The exosomal RNA applications, they go far beyond than just fishing out these mutations on the RNA. We can also look at the actual language, the RNA transcript, to understand how this, the cell is responding in different scenarios. However, it's a very complicated language. Cancer has a very complicated language that we need to decipher. This is a picture of the Enigma machine. And it was used to decode the German encrypted messages during the Second World War. The Allied forces, they could only read very simple messages before then, until the day they broke the code. Today we can use modern tools, computers, even machine learning, to break this code. However, we are up against a similar task. Uh, to monitor these complex RNA messages to understand diseases. And this will make it possible for us to also study other things than cancer. We have already started to look at many different applications, including we even have a project where we work with NASA to study the, the health of astronauts in space. So we can say that these exosomes are important for anything on the planet and beyond. The, fir uh, the first of these liquid biopsy tests are available 
already now. However, deciphering the RNA language for diagnostics may just be the beginning. When we've understood this chatter and the RNA language of cancer, we may actually be, uh, be able to use that against the cancer and participate in this Twitter war to actually battle cancer. There's a lot we can learn from bridging different scientific fields, and sometimes we need to challenge the norms to, to, and, and view problems from different angles to move forward. However, we all, always need to move forward, and the best way to predict a great future is to create it. And with that, thank you for listening.